Greetings, true seekers, paradigm busters, new world order, civil disobedience, freedom fighters, free thinkers, higher mammals, good people of all types. How's it going? My name is Michael Parker, and welcome to the 14th episode of The Electric Pyramid, coming to you as always from an undisclosed location somewhere in Hollywood, California. Today is Thursday, August the 28th, or perhaps it is the 29th, wherever you are at. We are bearing down on a, uh, I was going to say Memorial Day. Joe and I were just talking about that. It's actually, (laughs) it's all right. We're bearing down on a Labor Day weekend, um, at least here in California. The kids don't have to go to school tomorrow. So uh, you know what? Just get up all your kids, get up grandma, granddaddy, get everybody on the internet and let's do this show. Joe Kiernan, how are you doing? Fantastic. I feel like a hundred bucks. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like at least. great, man. I feel awesome. I feel like at least a hundred pennies. <laughs> it's got weight, you know. At least you're carrying weight, buddy. Some kind of mass. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, we are glad you are with us uh, here on Freedom Slips Revolution Radio. Once again, my name is Michael Parker, and we have got a humdinger of a show tonight. Uh, we are going to be joined shortly by the wonderful Monique Lassan, who has also got a show here on uh, Revolution Radio. And we're actually going to be talking about a very strange subject tonight, which is disappearances in national parks. But before we get to that, there was a couple things I wanted to uh, bring up. As many of you know, we had a 6.0 earthquake here on the West Coast on Sunday in the Napa uh, Valley region. And uh, I was looking around the web, and I saw this article. And this came out through the, I believe, the CBS uh, uh, affiliate there in San Francisco, and it was reported by, uh, I believe the reporter was Betty Yu. Anyway, what what the, what the point is, it's, I, I'm just going to read this short paragraph. Several people called the KPIX 5 newsroom after Sunday morning's magnitude 6.0 earthquake in Napa reporting mysterious flashes in the sky. Witnesses said the strange phenomena looked like lightning. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard of this many times before, and this is... This is not a new thing. Um, this is a real thing. Um, we've got theories as to what this is, but it is literally energy coming up from the ground associated with the tectonic plates moving. And uh, this one gentleman, if if you saw the Marfa Lights show that I did, we talked about this. They call them earthquake lights. Mm-hmm. It is uh, it's a, a quick buildup of stress with an electric current, and it causes it to flow to the surface and bust through the earth. So and this it, typically is happens. the same as ball lightning? Well, ball lightning is similar, and, and, and the specifics on how this work, we don't fully understand yet. And if people go to this article, it's it just uh, mysterious flashes in the sky during Napa quake. I'm sure you'll find it. There's one guy in the comments who's saying, and he's partially correct, that this effect has never been reproduced in a laboratory setting. Mm-hmm. But I would argue, guess what? When you can get a laboratory the size of a tectonic plate and generate those kind of stresses, then you might be able to reduce, uh, reproduce this situation. But it's real. It's not a UFO. It's nothing paranormal. But it is very unusual and, and really dramatic. And other people may remember that, that at another point in the week, there was a report of a pilot. And uh, I can't remember where he was flying, but he basically saw a red flash come up over the ocean and i think this is awesome. um around the time that the uh the peruvian earthquake happened long story mm-hmm. short ladies and gentlemen we are at a very exciting time um when we're learning more about the physical effects of these kind of geoelectric things that are occurring and um i think at some point it may play into a part of the UFO story. Listen, I still think that extraterrestrials have come and gone from this planet, but I'm always keeping my mind open to all types of different ideas. And I do believe that plasma, ball lightning, earthquake lights, all of the above, whatever they turn out to be, are something that are happening. And we are finally getting to a point uh, with our science and technology where we can uh, witness this and we're beginning to understand it. So... The, the the upside of this is that at some point in the future, we are hoping that we might even be able to predict earthquakes. If if people witness earthquake lights, 
Um, sometimes they happen before, sometimes they happen after. But if we can begin to measure the electricity that's being generated by these tectonic stresses, perhaps that can give us a little bit of an extra heads up. So if you saw that, um, it's really interesting. It really did happen. And I think that we're going to be hearing more and more about it as time goes on related to earthquakes. Uh, M- Mona from the station, uh, Herbal Fluzy in the chat room, she sent me something a few days ago. Uh, that for the last few years, basically, there's a, a off of my coast here, a large shelf sort of uh, shifted, a large it, containing a lot of methane gas, and it's been releasing a lot more than they've been telling us. And uh, and what? Yeah, that's dangerous. Well, yeah, and I'm just uh, you know that's just another thing to consider also in certain lights you know that people yeah. are claiming to see sometimes even myself. You know, uh, it's just something I'm keeping an eye on. It's something I never considered, and I, I thank you for sending that to me. That the methane really gas cool. releases, that's actually, that's a really serious situation. Um, uh, methane well, is... I know, is pl- see, right off of my coast, basically, I'm, right, I'm basically right on the end of what may or may, you know, right in the corner, the out edge of the Bermuda Triangle. And there's, I've heard theories for years about methane gases coming up, sinking ships, things like that. And but I hear of it, but you know, in my mind, that's it might as well be a thousand years ago because I don't hear of it sure. you know, as of late. But you know, it, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if this might. It, we, I'm going to keep my eye on it. Absolutely. I remember yeah. the conversation that I had with you and David Stanett at one point. I think I kind of bummed Stanett out, but my point was that when when I was talking about the lights that you're seeing, I'm not implying that. Those are definitely plasma or, or earthquake lights or, or ball lightning. I'm just saying I'm keeping all, you know, all options open. Everything's on the table right now. Yeah, yeah, and I will. Yeah. And uh, so I, I don't know what's going on there. And like my good friend Scott DeShane says, it's all of the above. You know, it's right. I'm, I'm not saying it's one thing or the other. I think it's a lot of different things. And when you see any type of object that's this anomalous, Gosh, I mean, yeah, I mean, everything should be on the table because it's – if you can't really triangulate it and you're not close enough to see it and you're looking through particulate matter in in the air, it, you know, it's just difficult to figure out what it is. So I was very excited when I saw this article because, the, the, the like I say, the upside of this is perhaps maybe in the future we'll be able to measure some of this energy um, – coming up from the ground and, and be able to anticipate earthquakes. So I wanted to bring that up. And another thing I wanted to say about last week's show about the Illuminati, we got a really good response to that. Um, I want to clarify one thing. When, when, when I'm talking about the Illuminati uh, generally, because Joseph Wages, I brought him on to explain the, the strict version of the historically correct Illuminati um, and what he described, Andrew Weishaupt's, uh, Illuminati did exist. So these days, when people talk about the Illuminati, like we said in the show, I think they're using it in such a, jo- a lar- uh, gen- general term that we can't say that that's the Illuminati that we're talking about because that Illuminati, as far as most of us can tell, does not exist. Now, here's my caveat. Do I think that there are groups of shadowy people that probably get together on the slide and create ideas or plans that then perhaps move forward certain agendas. Absolutely. Uh, the Bilderberger Group is a real group. Uh, the Trilateral Commission is a real thing. The G8. I mean, there's, there's various types of groups that get together and usually made up of movers and shakers and people of great influence. And those are just the ones that we know of. So um, I think it would behoove uh, us all, uh, when we talk about these kind of things and, and hear the people that listen to this show and people like myself, where we get, where we kind of get laughed at by a lot of folks, it's like, oh, it's the Illuminati. Ha ha ha. You know, uh, Lady Gaga is a member of the Illuminati or something. Jay Z is a, you know, listen, people, they are posing. Actually, with those- if, if Lady Gaga was running the Illuminati, I actually would be scared of the Illuminati. <laughs> and you know what? I'm very I- concerned if she was the one running things. Exactly. And um, 
I, you know, listen, I love the Rolling Stones, and like uh, our guest Robert Sullivan said at one time, he goes, "Well, hey, look at the Stones. You know, picked up on the whole you know Luciferian satanic thing." But you know, I think with Jay Z and guys like that, they're taking it in a much more serious uh, marketing thing. So don't get played. I'm not saying that shadowy groups do not exist, but the right. term the Illuminati, um, the historical Illuminati. Um, was an actual group that I don't actually think was that bad and actually had some good ideas, but they do not exist anymore. Now, I do believe that there are people with dark intentions who probably do meet behind closed doors, affect policy, affect, uh, affect, uh, geopolitical agendas. And you know what? I mean, a lot of it's probably done in corporate boardrooms as well. So, right. yes, I do believe that there are people up to no good. They probably do meet in secret. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as them being the quote unquote Illuminati, I don't think that actually exists. I'm with you. So, uh, but there's still bad folks out there. So, regardless of what you call them. Right. And I, I just wanted to clear that up because even this week, uh, the god awful VMAs were on and MTV. <laughs> had the balls, pardon me, the, the testicular fortitude to tease us all with the idea on their own website, did the Illuminati control the VMAs? Ladies and gentlemen, when MTV starts talking about the Illuminati meme, it's over, okay? It's like, it, 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 now, it, it is a joke. I didn't even, so. I didn't even know that. Yeah, well, I, I'm a pop culture fiend, so I, I – and I actually watched it because my daughters wanted to see some of the performers. And uh, and listen, over the years, I've watched, you know, like when Madonna did the Super Bowl, which was really odd. Um, and then a few – a year or two ago, you know, like uh, Katy Perry did this kind of – I was a former of, employee of MTV, but that was a number of years ago. I think that was before I knew you. That, that's that was, true. I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, that's right when uh, I stopped working for them when I moved out there to L.A. Well, you know, I mean, at one point, I think there was, uh, was it MTV 2 or 3 or something? They had a logo with a three-headed dog, which uh, many of the conspiracy theorists said, oh, my God, that's Severus, you know, and yeah. uh, that that's – listen, I have no doubt that there are people with bad intentions, and they're probably at – just like Verstappen said, um, you know, corporations are made for psychopaths. If you're going to, cl- <laughs> if you're going to climb the corporate ladder – you have to be that type of a person that you are willing to cut off some heads and right. step it's on. To be the, the guy from American Psycho. Yeah, you have to be kind of like that. And uh, so I, I, I do <laughs> believe that there are some bad folks out there who really do not care I'm not um, bad about, it. about other folks. But it's just interesting. I think that we need to bring our idea of a so-called Illuminati into a little bit sharper focus. And you know what? They don't even have to be – um, yeah, stop, imbued, stop stealing the, cool names from the enlightened people. Th- there you – well said. Well said, Joe. I think you just made my point actually. <laughs> I, well, some, sometimes I have to just speak up. Oh, well, you, you are exactly right. I tell you what. That's as good a segue as I can make. Ladies and gentlemen, before we bring on Monique, let me uh, remind you. Please go to my YouTube page. I have just revamped it as of today. All of the uh, – Electric Pyramid shows, at least the ones that we have up, um, are in one playlist. All the old Dark dark Matter shows are in a playlist. Some of my music is in a playlist. So it's all there, very easy for you guys to get to. It's just Colonel Tex, C-O-L-O-N-E-L-T-X, on YouTube, or go to Michael Parker Media. Either way, but please, uh, please go on there and sign up. I'm going to be trying to... Put a lot of new stuff on there. Keeping up with uh, Brother Joe, he has a great, great site as well. And uh, right, you I, see, the station just redid the whole, uh, the whole archive section it's, so, uh, in a so podcast tell, format. It's pretty cool. You should check it out. I will, Joe. Tell me this: Did they ever figure out what was going on? Why, why YouTube was shutting them down? I'm not too. I'm not too sure what the specifics are, uh, honestly, on uh, what the difficulties were, but. I know it's just uh, it's just too much of a hassle, and uh, it's better if we did focus on building a, a nice proper archive where someone can get high quality audio. And I agree. You could, you could you could just go through. Now the podcast is in podcast format, so you're going to be able to uh, scroll through and, and read things about the shows, and you're going to be able to have all the show the whole show list right in front of you, as opposed to scrolling through thousands of videos because. Revolution Radio was putting up a thousand videos, uh, you know, every couple of weeks. 
No, I, I get it. I'm, you know, so, no, the reason uh, I'm really, I'm actually really happy about it. But I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it was anything, one thing specific, Michael. I think it was just uh, a few things in general, and with with so many videos, and uh, the, you know, it's. Uh, I just don't know the specifics, buddy. No, I thought we must be doing something right. That's why they were shutting us down. You know, <laughs> That's like, probably <laughs> most likely a great part of it. Uh, uh, it uh, you know, they uh, really make sure you, uh, you you follow every single strict guideline when uh, they're, they really don't want your material on there to begin with. Well, so, that's, um, they're, they're, that was why, they were pretty why tough was, on things. That's why I was so intrigued because, you know, I listened to a lot of different things. And, like, that same week that we got taken down twice, Alex Jones was saying, oh, my God, you know, they're, they're, they're taking down some of my videos. They're taking down some of our Twitter stuff. So I just found it interesting. I God knows what it was. to other people as well. And, uh, I, I've been pretty lucky myself so far, but I look at it saying, you know, wow, I have all kinds of crazy stuff on mine, you know? Yep. Uh, it would, what I would call crazy. But right. I actually well, call it wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful. And it's, it, it's, good for, uh, it's good for all of us to have that kind of stuff out there. Ladies and gentlemen, um, without further ado, let me give you an introduction to our guest tonight. Um, I'm very pleased to have Monique Lassan on. She is a fellow host here on the Revolution Radio Network. Her own show is uh, Private Eye Matrix Revealed, which is Wednesdays from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, but tonight, what I want to talk to Monique about, she is a private detective. And I'm going to just, if you're not familiar with Monique, she's a wonderful lady. I'm going to give you a little intro to what she's about. Monique Lassan is a multilingual licensed private investigator with over 10 years of experience. She completed her studies in criminal justice and received her bachelor degree in 1993 and later her master's in forensic science. Monique has conducted extensive international investigations and recovery of abducted children and runaways, locating missing persons, sex trafficking cases, infidelities, undercover sting operations, criminal defense investigations, and surveillance. She's an expert in child abduction recoveries and has recovered children from Singapore, Mexico, England, Nicaragua, Saipan, San Diego. Monique speaks fluent Farsi, English, French, and Spanish. She was elected as the district governor of the California Association of Licensed Investigators in 1999 and 2000. And Monique has been involved in human trafficking projects as an activist since 2008 and is the founder and creator of the Teens Against Human Trafficking Project. And she makes me feel very inadequate. <laughs> Monique, are you on the uh, line? <laughs> Yes, I am. Greetings. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, awesome. Uh, actually, it's interesting because I'm always reading other people's profile and <laughs> <laughs> Hello, to have mine heard. Hi, Joe. How are you tonight? I'm great. I'm, I'm you know, Joe and I go a long time now. <laughs> He's also my producer and I'm so glad to I'm, be I'm here. I'm happy to have the both of you right here together. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, this is, this is good Thank fun. You. Um, I've listened to Monique's show quite a few times, and uh, we have some shared interests, which we perhaps will get into in the second hour regarding UFOs and ETs and things like that. But Monique, what, I just recently found out that, that you were looking into the situation with the disappearances in national parks. And this is something that I've been hearing about. Yeah, I mean, there's, listen, there's so many different subjects that we could all look into, and, and we tend to kind of gravitate towards the things that tend to interest us over and over and it just seems like everywhere you turn there's something strange that you could look into but this has been popping up a little bit more and more over the past year and then when joe mentioned to me that you were getting ready to do a documentary on this subject i was like man we, we i would really love to have her on the show so tell me a little bit of just about your hit before we get into this fully tell me about your history as a private detective well, okay. Um, started out with my mother, who was a policewoman from one of the first policewomen from Iran, back when the Shah was alive, mm -hmm. and uh, she's passed on for a long time. But uh, she was the first female uh, policewoman in Iran. So I, I just got that from her, I think. And uh, then, you know, right when I became a licensed investigator back in the nineties. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you exactly when, then you'll know <laughs> exactly okay. how long I've been doing this. <laughs> okay. But a long time, a long time, over, over 10, 15 years. And uh, basically, I started out as a criminal investigator and doing undercover work and surveillance and infidelity. And I just, you know, I got tired of 
giving bad news to people. I don't want, I'm, I'm not here to judge. I just wanted to find my niche. Uh, I was abducted myself when I was 19 uh, from <laughs> Beverly Hills, actually, in L.A. I want, and, to, I, I want to follow up on that in a minute because I didn't know if I could ask you about that or not, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm writing a book, so it, it, yeah, <laughs> let me just kind of tell you a little bit of time because when I, when I escaped, I was hurt, but I escaped. I decided to pass this on to other people, the, the information that I know, what to do, what not to do. I, and I got really interested in recovery, locating a recovery of missing children, period. And not just children, but young adults as well. And it's not just girls, but also boys. Mm-hmm. And um, I decided to write a book um, about four years ago. Believe me, I haven't been able to finish it because all I, read, all I do is read other people's books now right. <laughs> from my own show. Um, but I got interested in doing child abduction cases. And I started Teens Against Human Trafficking in 2010. I got uh, 25 kids to go on television, and we did a film, which was kind of like a documentary. Uh, And then all I wanted to do is teach kids about human trafficking through doing films so they can teach their peers. Mm -hmm. And it was a success because uh, it was at Hillsborough High School, and these kids got up in front of 300 other kids and showed the film and talked about human trafficking, something they've never done before. And I got them on the radio. So that was my first project. Um, I also was the moderator for Human Trafficking Awareness Day in 2009, where I brought 300 people and I brought the Homeland Security, FBI, local law enforcement, and places like uh, Missy and... um, Oh, I forgot the other one now. But there, these are local businesses where they take human trafficking victims and give them a home. Mm-hmm. And they help them. So they don't have to go back to the country where they, they were abused in the first place. Right. Um, so it was incredible. So I was exhausted. <laughs> I, I was exhausted by the time t- 2011 came around and I, I started the nonprofit the organization, which was, again, Teens Against Human Trafficking, but on a bigger scale, and um, I had to close it because it was taking a lot of, away from my own business. Mm-hmm. In fact, everyone was ta- coming to me, didn't want to pay, and everybody just wanted me to travel around the world for free. Sure. They didn't understand that I have to raise money in order to recover children. Yes. So uh, I closed that, but of course, I always like to have a project somehow re- related to children. And when I, when I did a lot of investigation of missing children, a lot of those children have been missing, and I'm sick to my stomach. 180,000 children go missing, according to the Department of Justice, every year from the United States alone. But only 20, 20, 25% of them are runaways, human trafficking victims, or missing uh, run, um, children like parental child abductions, and some of them are kids, very little children that are taken by pedophiles, and they don't survive more than a couple of days. Monique, hold on just a second. I want to make sure I understand this correctly. I think you just said um, uh, annually there's 180,000 children that are that go missing each year in the U.S., mm-hmm. and did you say that 25% of them were were – it could constitute the 25% for me because I'm not sure I'm understanding what, what, because that's making Only me think the. Perc- yeah, a small percentage of those are talked about. They, you never see them on television. They never, mm-hmm. They've never been recovered. So the only ones that are being investigated is when a, a mother or father, they're in a custody battle. One of them is taking a child ac- across international borders. Or domestic, but usually international borders. Uh, some of them are runaways. They get caught in human trafficking and they get sexually exploited. They, mm-hmm. You know, and um, and the rest of them are little children that are taken by strangers. Some of them I own 
family members, which is sick. But where are the rest of them? 180,000 children go missing, and there are a very small percentage of them uh, that are involved in those so kinds of things. Here comes okay, so you're saying that that 75 percent of the of these children that go missing, there's just no no classification yes. that you can put them in. There's just no clue as to what happened. They're never found. Yes, they're never found, and nobody talks about them. We don't know where they are. Are they taken by extraterrestrials? Are they taken by the government for government um, experimentations? So for viruses, I mean, we don't know where they are. I'm not saying. Either or. I'm just saying, where are our kids? Yes. And I know for a fact that a lot of them also have gone missing, based on my own investigations, from national parks. Uh, my, when, I, when I listened to David Politis, which he was talking about people going missing in cluster, I realized that a lot of children go missing, period, from national parks. And I have to say that one of the things that I have to do as part of my project before I die is finding out what the heck is going on right. with our children, at least in the United States. I'm not even touching the world uh, or, you know, Europe has their own, because I've brought a lot of speakers that talk about those things as well, and they have their own number of children that go missing or people go, go, that go missing and no one knows where they are. They're from Europe or South America or Middle East. I'm just focusing in the United States. Right. Well, that's what you should do because, uh, yeah, you can't – you can be more effective – listen, the United States is 360, 350 million some odd people, so that, that already is a very large undertaking. Right. Um, so I have uh, started just, in fact, two, three days ago, which took me three weeks to put it together through Kickstarter. I talked to several video film uh, individuals that they do a, a lot of film and videos, and they're very connected with the, uh, with the business of film uh, through their parents. And I've mm -hmm. talked to them. I asked them, I said, what do you think? Would you be able to help me put this thing together? And we have to go to every national parks, and not just national parks, or any parks, Certainly. anywhere. We'll see where they end, we end up. I am not putting my fingers, and I don't want to jump the gun and say, yeah, it was Bigfoot <laughs> that took <laughs> all these kids. I don't want to say that. I am right. an investigator. I'm very skeptical. I am, I've been in business a long time. And I got to do things according to what makes sense. Yes. Investigate it and see who's missing from where. Talk to witnesses. And I want to document this. And if I come across that some kind of conspiracy is going on with the government or extraterrestrials or whatever, then we'll, we'll hit that when we come right. across it. I'm very uh, objective. Right. Well, I, this is one of those things where it's a subject that's hitting critical mass because, listen, I always try to keep my ear to the ground about a lot of uh, paranormal slash conspiracy slash just strange occurrences. And David Politi's uh, and, and, and these stories kept popping up. And I'll be honest, I really had not given it the, the, the attention that it should. And then... All of a sudden, when Joe mentioned this, I'm like, you know what, I've got to look into this. And just in looking into it today, my mind is blown. Um, the, the things that I found out just today about these missing people, it's very, very strange, super creepy. Um, what, in your years of looking for missing people, what do you think might be happening? Well, honestly... Um Many things because I have yes. been involved with this. I mean, <laughs> I'm very skeptical with an open mind. Yes. I've been studying a lot of other things as well, such as, you know, the Montauk projects and, yes. uh, and you know, a lot of things. The Montauk boys that go missing, they, go, they get taken through, uh, thrown into time warp. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen it. Right. So I can't really say where these children are. Sure. I can say that. But it's not being investigated for whatever reason. That's right. 
And just like David Pilates talks about people going in clusters, well, I've never experienced that. So if I come across that, then I will investigate it. All I can say, children go missing. Uh, I, I know, I knew Ted Gunderson very personally. He was one of you my did. best friends. Yes. Really? Ted Gunderson and I, he actually, as a joke, asked me to marry him, and I laughed. <laughs> and I told explain, him, I said, <laughs> Tom, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, explain to our audience who Ted Gunderson is. Okay. Ted Gunderson, who was the FBI, he was the former um, FBI direct, um, he was not the director, but he was high up there in the FBI. Uh, many years ago, when he was involved with the McMartin case, where the children were being taken underneath those tunnels and being, um, you know, sat- they were sold or sacrificed for t- satanic cults. When I knew Ted, he came to me when, during one of my human trafficking um, talk, and he says that he really wants to combine forces because he was also a private investigator, and he wanted to see what it is that where are the children that's exactly what he was fighting for what his angle was that they were being taken by satanic cults Mm -hmm. Um, interestingly enough I have done satanic cult cases as a private investigator many years ago where I had this client of mine who was the psychiatrist for this woman who was kidnapped since she was 10 years old, sold by her own parents to satanic cult, raped over and over, and she developed like 30-something personality. And I got involved... Um, and anyway, she, she was taken to a foster homes. The psychi- psychiatrist went and adopted her... By the time I knew her, she already was pretty much healed, but except every Halloween, she was still afraid of being taken. For years, she's been kidnapped. This woman was really messed up. Mm-hmm. And I was hired, and I told them uh, that I will look after them over the Halloween that was coming up. But anyways, uh, these people came into the house. She shot at them. Uh, it, There were bullets everywhere. They tried to kidnap her, all of that. So I know for a fact that children do go missing because of satanic calls. And I used to live in San Diego, and there are areas like Lakeside and uh, uh, wherever I'm not, Escondido area. Yeah, there are a lot of places in those areas that um, kids are kidnapped and satanic calls actually exist. That's just one thing. Right. What's your because, opinion? Well, here's the deal. I, I think it is a lot of different things, but what was particularly dis- disturbing to me uh, is in reading in some of uh, Politis' cases that the people were disappearing in very close range, at least the ones within the national parks, to the family members that they had come with. And in some cases... Um, their clothes would be found neatly neatly folded or they would be on the ground as if the person literally melted and they just fell to the ground in place of where they thought the human being had been. In some cases, he also said that the bodies, if they were finally found, would be found miles from where the supposed disappearance had taken place in places that really physically they could not have gotten to most likely. And secondly, in some cases, when the bodies were found, they were found in areas that had already been searched, sometimes multiple times. And then the weirdest, one of the weirdest things was I was reading that in some cases where they brought in tracking dogs that, and this is an unbelievable statistic to me, because usually when I hear 98 or 99 percent, I'm very skeptical. But the, the statistic that I read was that in 98 to 99 percent, when they brought in tracking dogs, the dogs either could get no scent at all or they refused to track at all, which to me is just ultra creepy. Right, right. Okay. As an investigator, since I, I'm not familiar with that kind of situation, I need fact, I need to see those reports, I need to see exactly what happened. I also read part of the book, and I know he's talking about uh, the fact that perhaps 
these people that were found at later time, they didn't know where they were. Right. Or that they had missing time, it seems yes. like it. Which seems, I'm also a MUFON investigator, by the way. I'm a field investigator and sec- state section director, which means that I've also investigated a lot of UFO sightings, talked to a lot of abductees. And it's very, very also possible that children also go missing because of abductions. Yes. I, I've talked to uh, Denise Stoner and Kathleen Martin. Uh, in regards to the UFOs and actually uh, Denise Stoner was kidnapped herself or abducted from her own bedroom and she went right through the walls and her sister who was in the crib crib, uh, (laughs) was found later outside her own crib like a little baby I'm talking about and Mm -hmm. she ended up on the couch hours later which Mm -hmm. is very very strange so there are many reasons why children go missing. I see that uh, Don put on, on Skype that motorcycle gangs possibly. Yes, definitely. Uh, but what's interesting to me is where are the parents of these children that are not investigating these kids that go missing? What's up with that? Wait, wait, wait. wait. Hold on. Are you saying that you... you that there are some cases and, and the parents do not push for an investigation? Yes. Why would they do that? Well, I don't, well listen, when I say that 180,000 people, children that go missing, mm-hmm. 20, 25% of them are being investigated because I personally get contacted by the parents in order to find these children. Where, where's the rest of those other ones right. that are not investigated, parents are not coming forward, Are they in a la-la land? Don't they know a child has gone missing? We should research that. Well, part of the reason that I asked you that was actually just to hear your answers. I mean, yes, listen, if a parent is not going to push for an investigation of a missing child, then something is obviously amiss. Um, I believe that we also have another member of your team um, that we can bring on here. Don, are you online? Yes, I am. Hi. Hey, Don. This is Michael Parker. How are you? Hey, Michael. Good. Good to have be on your show. Hi, Don. Uh, and and Don, now what are you what are you doing um, with the documentary? Well, uh, Monique uh, uses me in a lot of different capacities where she can in terms of uh, she, I, I uh, I've helped her volunteer to, to recover some kids and things where um, she gives me something to do and I'll try to. Go after it, basically. Uh, understood. Have you have you been intrigued by this this subject for a while, or is this something new to you, or have you been looking into it? Yes, I have. I mean, to me, I'm passionate about children, about education, and such. And I've worked a lot with children in my earlier years. And so, um, but what's curious to me is I've had uh, friends that were trained at Fletsey Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and uh, one of them, uh, being a park ranger, had gone through an intensive training with. A, uh, a guy who he said he normally he was not supposed to teach their park ranger class the things mm-hmm. he was teaching him he says but I'm t- teaching you guys because you're going to have to deal with them more than anybody else mm-hmm. and he had been undercover in motorcycle gangs for uh, a number of years where he'd gone through different stints to try to pierce the um, get through to it's very hard to get into a motorcycle organization undercover and it takes years because there's a trust factor. So he actually would have to accompany these gangs on their crimes. Yeah. Participate. Very, a very uh, disturbing kind of odd class, but uh, very unique. And one of the things that the motorcycle gangs would do at the time, and this is the eighties and nineties is uh, actually, I guess he was doing it in the seventies, eighties. They would film their escapades. They'd film their events. Um, They'd have their structure and their hierarchy, you know, their master of arms. There was master of, ceremony and master of entertainment and one of the things master of entertainment would do in the motorcycle gang is go out and find entertainment and he described uh, that uh, this friend of mine who watched these videos um, said that uh, these gangs would go out and find young girls or young children young kids uh, for their entertainment and bring them back to the and they would often camp out in the national parks and that's why he was showing these videos and uh, 
did they abuse them or did they kill them or both? Uh, everything in between, and then that would be an end result because, of course, they right. want to keep going back. So, um, the drugs involved, uh, rape, um, yeah. sadomasochism, or even things that sounded like um, sort of a cult kind of uh, sure. activities. And it depends on the gangs. I mean, there, there's a lot of motorcycle gangs that the public, general public, hasn't heard of uh, that are not, you know, there's the Hell's Angels that was known. And then they started getting attorneys and putting money away and had people who, um, you know, they bought skyscrapers. So they, they have ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, there's different levels of say, even the, the hell's angels where, um, there's the street guys or there's the guys doing the drugs and there's casual members and there's, so there, there's a whole echelon. What was interesting to me is whenever I talked to somebody like this, probably there's, there's a few other people too. I have uh, some police officer friends trained at Fletzy who talked about some similar things, I have another police officer I knew growing up who used to go undercover literally also in motorcycle gangs and he didn't get his graphic, but he told some similar stories. Um, so I had some cross referencing. I had different uh, people who had over the years come across, um, and come across their stories. And at first it was pretty shocking to hear this stuff. And so that what I'm saying is that with something like national parks, there's always these things going on and we just want to go about our day, get our paycheck, go home, take care of our kids, worry about our, our troubles in our world. And uh, when there's something like this outside the box, it gets swept aside or under the rug. Mm -hmm. So what I'm curious about is why was the national parks giving this other researcher difficulty in, uh, in disclosing the names, the numbers and the amounts? Why was he being given the runaround and why do the national parks want to sweep this under the rug? Well, Obviously, national parks don't want a reputation of, hey, come here, and motorcycle gangs come here to, to uh, rape and kill children. That's not a very pleasant thought for anybody. And it's not something in the 1950s mind or 70s mind of a family household could handle. But like you said, we're reaching critical mass. So these subjects have been very real, but they've been avoided. And with someone like Monique going in here and trying to investigate, there's an opportunity to have another angle to scratch at the door and try to gain some publicity and try to get some traction on what is going on. Why are you entrusted? Just like our government, just like, you know, the local government or the, or the state or the federal governments, you're entrusted with a duty for us. And obviously mm -hmm. they're not doing those duties. Right. I was pretty shocked to find the national parks resisting this guy's inquiries. And trying Absolutely. To but, you know, the, the, the park rangers I worked with when I was working in the national parks are very different than um, the administration. And when you get up to the governmental levels of a, of a body like this. Um, but, you know. I, I wanted to kind of interject. And when, when I found out that a lot of these children, <clears throat> people in general, but a lot of my focus has always been the children. Uh, well, a lot of people go missing because maybe they get lost in the river or, or you know, sure. the hikes. Those are different. But these are actually kids and people that are going missing and nobody is coming forward. Either A, look for them, or B, what's, what's the purpose of the national park trying to, or the law enforcement trying to hush hush something like this? Uh, I don't understand that. And I really would like to investigate that further. Yeah. We, are, we are speaking with Monique Lassan. And uh, Don Moore's head, we are talking about these mysterious disappearances that are happening in the national parks of North America. And I guess one of the things that's that's very strange to me, I mean, certainly we always hear about the kids who who hike into the woods and they become uh, separated from each other. Maybe they're partying and doing drugs or what have you. And then, you know, several hundreds of thousand dollars later, you know, the city finds them or what have you. But here on the West Coast, I mean, when when – when it when they were talking about Yosemite, I was like, I was like, man, it just seems like every year or two, we hear about some strange uh, disappearance. A lot of times, it's women in Yosemite, and it seems right. like if, if if I am to try to distill Polita's work down after one day, which is obviously more than premature, but in doing my research for this, I was just trying to scan a lot of his stuff. Was that Yosemite was the national park with the highest numbers now of course here again those are the things that we know of but what's strange to me is in the times when people get lost 
or they get separated or they're intoxicated. We either, we usually find their bodies or we find them. But a lot of the cases he's talking about is nothing is ever right. recovered. Nothing. Yeah, and, right. I think we're going to find that there are a lot of cases that you can figure, okay, this may have happened, that may have happened. There may be some question marks. Like they were lost in a backpacking trail and their gear was found. It, it's more likely that something else happened. <laughs> other than uh, a motorcycle gang abduction. So you could probably put them into different classifications, but the numbers are off the charts. So yes, some people would die, like like in New Zealand when I traveled there, one of the things was they lose a lot of people in New Zealand, and sometimes they don't even find their gear. Um, but it's also a very dense forests, and uh, people can get lost and disoriented e- easily, so they could die by natural causes. But you, you can't but, have... But at these- some point they find their bodies. Well, um, but, I mean, the fact that the people just disappear and vanish, and that, that's really interesting because, I, like, they existed one day, the next day, they find the clothes, but they don't find the bodies, and mm-hmm. the clothes are neatly just packed in one section as if they just took the body. And, I mean, that in itself, and I, I'll be honest with you, Michael, I'm going to approach it as an investigator. Yes. And whatever comes up, that's what I'm going to report. Yeah. Because um, I'd like to know who, what are the names of like those witnesses that he has interviewed as it said, well, uh, the person was disoriented. I'm going to do my own investigation, in other words. Absolutely. Because have obviously, you, ch- yeah, go ahead. Uh, have you, have you uh, spoken to him or reached out to him or at all? Or? Yeah, I have. I, was, uh, I asked him about a month month and a half ago or two months ago to uh-huh. come on my show. I yeah. told him that I'm a licensed investigator. My, my focus is locating and recovery of missing children and human trafficking victims. I mean, and he wrote, by, and, and I'd like to invite him to be on my show. And I'm interested in his book, Missing 411. Uh, he wrote back and he said, well, he doesn't want to go on, the, on other people's shows when they haven't read the book. Of missing for one one, I said reading books are my middle name. <laughs> right. <laughs> it seems like that's all I do is reading books. Yeah. I said send me your book. I will be more than happy to read it. Yeah. And I'm not talking about human trafficking here. I'm talking about children going missing. And because he said, well, if it's human trafficking, then it's not a fit. I said, well, this has absolutely nothing to do with human trafficking. I'm asking you to just talk about. People going missing in clusters from national parks. Mm-hmm. And he says, well, unless you read my book, I'm not going to come to your show. I said, well, well that's definitely your choice. But I'm be more than happy to read your book. That's unfortunate that he took that approach. Let me ask you this. Um, so you guys want to do a, an inv- a full investigation and do a documentary of this. So you, you put up a Kickstarter page so people can contribute to that. Um, can we get that and drop it into the, uh, the, the chat room, Joe? Yeah. That, 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 that address? Currently doing it right this moment. Cool. Buddy. Right on. <laughs> and, and give it to us so I can I mention it on the air because I, I want to see this get done. Um, Monique, what is your approach to how you want to, uh, to do the investigation? How, do you, how are you planning on going about this? First of all, the project is called Vanished. So Vanished. Great this name. Is about, yeah, the people that go missing. And I wanted to kind of, before I answer your question, kind of just tell you a little bit about the project. Go for uh, it. It's, we need people who can pledge their backers to basically back the project. And they can pledge anything from a dollar to a thousand dollars. It doesn't really matter to me. I just want people to be aware because my approach of this whole thing is let's get it out. Let people see the videos. I want to get it on television. I want to get it on the radio. I want, to, I want people to be aware of what's going on in this country. And my approach is that I want to find out who's all missing. Then I'm going to interview witnesses, family members, law enforcement, park rangers, and more. But mm-hmm. I need to find out uh, exactly. I don't want to st- step on anyone's toes. I'm going to do my own investigations. And if oh, I right. come across that some people have gone vanished, basically, uh, and no one knows why, then we can investigate further as to what those possibilities could be. Is it a big, the Bigfoot is there? I mean, uh, it, are, do, no, I mean, seriously. We, no, I know, I know. About, <laughs> and, 
Uh, do we have a lot of sightings there? Uh, do we have a lot of UFO sightings? Which, by the way, there are. Yes. There are a lot of sightings, not only in Yosemite, but uh, around um, a lot of the national parks where I'm familiar with. Um, like, uh, obviously, Mount Shasta is another that was gonna be, that, Yeah, of course. That was what I was about to say, yes. And pe- uh, children and people have gone missing from Mount Shasta area. Yes. And boy. And, and when, when I, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean to laugh about the Bigfoot thing. Listen, everything is on the table. Listen, here, here's my wild-eyed, crazy idea. <laughs> Tell uh, me. So when I'm reading about this, it's more like... It's more like a vortex. It's all. It's it's almost like a miniature Bermuda Triangle or something. And people are literally just going missing, and then they're reappearing in some other place. So listen, I'm I'm not um, I'm not saying that it's not UFOs. It's not Bigfoot. It's not motorcycle gangs. I don't know what it is. It it's it's stranger than a fiction. <laughs> t- it's 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 stranger than a typical. Answer could there is no typical answer. I mean, the the cases that that I was looking at are just so unusual, and oftentimes the children would wander away from their parents, but they didn't wander that far. Or people would simply be walking. I read something today. Now this actually happened in the 1800s, where a man uh, was in front of his home. And I don't remember if this was in the U.S. or abroad, but it, I was just looking into mysterious disappearances, and a man literally disappeared in front of his wife, children, and the local judge in a rural area. Now, of course, you know, listen, this is, we don't have videotape of the event. All we have is a written record, but it's just, it's just really, really strange. And the thing that was, that was very troublesome to me, um, if we are to believe you know, Politis, which I have no reason not to, was just the fact that, listen, if the dogs are getting spooked or they refuse to track, then we've got people who are being found miles away from where they disappeared in places that logistically they should not have probably been able to get on their own. That's just very strange to me. And that means that someone is moving them or they are being moved in some fashion. Yes. Is it possible? <laughs> yes. As ancient age. Aliens, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, anyways, um, but is it possible that we actually have vortexes, just like you said, as they exist near Mount Shasta, and right. uh, different dimensions, different um, worlds that we we are not, we don't know about. It, right. It's very possible that there are those time warps that opens up and just swallows people in clusters. I don't know, but I would say that. It could be possible. I haven't seen it. I have to investigate it. Right. And then on the other hand, of course, there's the possibility that they are being kidnapped for some nefarious reason by a group that's extremely stealthy. And now, is that the quote-unquote government? Is that some form of uh, shadowy group that's performing some kind of... I mean, it's just so strange. We I don't know. We may come across that. You know what, Michael? One of the things that uh, I would say... If we, we come across something that like that, and I heard you talk about Illuminatis a little bit earlier, yes. then it, they were allowed to be kidnapped. Right. Just like human trafficking, sex trafficking right. victims are allowed to be kidnapped or abducted by sex traffickers right. and, uh, you know, a lot of... Um, travel agencies or adoption agencies they look the other way or law enforcement agencies that look the other way and they allow the process to go forward to the next step yes. so if that's the case and they these kids did not just disappear into some kind of a time warp then the the law enforcement is looking the other way the question is why for right. what well, the thing that's particularly concerning about that, and I know we're coming up on the top of the hour, so we're going to be taking mm-hmm. a break. But um, one of the things right here is it, is it that we're, time, Joe? We're coming right in, buddy. I'm sorry about that. Let's <laughs> take a break, you guys. Electric pyramid. See you. Don't on the forget other side. what you're going to say. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Ladies and gentlemen, truth seekers, good people, higher mammals, fellow seekers. My name is Michael Parker. Welcome to the second hour of the Electric Pyramid. And tonight we're speaking with Monique Lassan, 
and Don Morshead. We are talking about this spate of mysterious disappearances that have happened throughout North America in national parks. And before we return to that discussion, I just want to remind you that uh, Revolution Radio, Freedom Slips, we are completely listener supported. And if you dig what we're doing, you know, throw us a chip or two, throw us, throw us a dollar or whatever you can, or think of it as tithing. Think of it as uh, helping out your brothers and sisters that are trying to help you out with some truth and some interesting information. So just go to the freedomslips.com website and uh, help us out if you can. Um, it is 10 o'clock here on the West Coast, and let's jump back into our discussion. Uh, Monique, where we, where I was going right before the break was that the thing that, the thing that really troubled me is, is supposedly, according to Politis, he's getting the runaround from the National Parks, uh, department. And that is, that's very strange to me. That, that's really troublesome because on the one hand, and they were claiming that they weren't keeping, I guess, records of missing people, which seems like that can't possibly be true. And then on the second hand, if they were going to give him those records, he was going to have to pay for them. Now, certainly, I would not be surprised if there were a small administration fee attached to something like that. But to give him the runaround in the first place and then charge an exorbitant amount, out, which something that really should just be public record, really stinks to high heaven. Well, okay. Uh, first of all, you asked me earlier, how would I go about this? First of all, we need to find out how many people uh, slash children have gone missing within certain time. Let's right. say for, for the last 20 years because yeah. public record doesn't really go any farther back. Otherwise, it becomes archived. And I'll tell you this as an investigator, uh, maybe the national parks. It depends. Some places, they don't even keep the archives. They just get rid of it after 7 to 10 years. All right, so let's just say within Monique, the last 10 years. Monique, yes. Let me just ask you this, because I would understand that. Um, now, we are talking about you know the government and bureaucracy, and, and that's <laughs> all bets are off. But in a day of, of digital mediums, it just seems difficult for me to believe, because now you're no longer taking up physical space. You're taking up cyberspace. So it just seems I, that, that, that doesn't seem credible to me that they don't keep some kind of a record. <laughs> let me tell you. Um, Again, seven to ten years is the maximum people keep records. Okay. And in fact, I, where was I? I was in Long Beach, not even last, I think it was last year, and I was trying to do some investigation there. Do you know that I had to go through Microfish and page by page of a book looking for people <laughs> or some public record on paper is unheard of? And right. this is Long Beach. Do you actually believe that in some of these national parks where they are out somewhere in the boonies, things are digitized? No, they're not. First. Second of all, if they are archived, they probably don't have access to it. Now, I'd like to know who has gone missing, who's looking for those people, and then when you go in that area and you ask questions about it, I want to know if they're going to have some answers. Or not? Has it been any re report, report on this or not? We'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, that's how it's going to be done. It, it doesn't surprise me that there would be. Listen, the state of California, we're running out of money in almost every every department, um, and it seems like the money that we spend is is on things that we don't need to spend it on. So, I guess it doesn't surprise me that public records are not being put in a digital format as I would have anticipated they would, but still. This it, it still stinks to me that he is having the trouble that he's having getting these types of records. And the reason I say that is it it to me that infers that there is something wrong, and it's not just a PR thing that we're talking about. It's not just trying to keep the appearance of the parks being safe so we don't scare off our customers. Mm -hmm. it, it 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 reeks of something else. Yeah, so yeah. I say let's give him some extra help and some unexpected help from the side. And also, this is like a grassroots effort because uh, Monique is literally doing it through Kickstarter. So the the interesting part about this is that it's not just going to be done and, and not made to make a book. Uh, although David Goliath didn't, uh, he said he didn't start this out to do a book. He found so much information and turned into that. But uh, 
this is a chance for people to participate personally and help in the project and be part of it as it grows. It's definitely going to take more than just this seed money. So hopefully the Kickstarter will get enough to actually be realized and maybe go over the top on it. But uh, if people spread this out, if people can help us spread this like wildfire and have it go uh, at least sub-viral, if not viral, we might get a lot of response and get enough money to really start uh, following this. And if we, if we have enough, we can also do a web page where people can follow the progress. Yes, and the, and the video will be shared with everyone. And anyone who's interested, they can actually email me personally at investigatrix at gmail.com. And I will send them the link because the beauty of this is, is there's a time limit to it. I only have 42 days to raise $25,000. And that goes toward just literally accessing, paying for people's expenses and putting the video together, doing the film, and go all over the United States to all the national parks. And if I don't get that 25000 within the 42 days that I have left, all the backers get all, I mean, they don't even get charged. All the money goes back to them. Right. And, and I don't well, get my money either. So, well, so you listen. don't have to worry about paying if, if everybody else also meets the mark. So it's a real pleasant thing as a, as a person participating in giving that you know, hey, I can put my money up. And if this whole thing comes together, I'm my money will be taken with everybody else's as a group effort. And like Monique says, this is just a beginning. But uh, we, we, if you can email, if anybody out there has ideas, email Monique their ideas or their willingness to help. Sort of like a politi- someone running for mayor, grassroots, the whole town gets involved. Let's get involved and see who might have resources or ideas out there to raise money within or, or without Kickstarter and raise awareness. And maybe even resources that will help us in researching or in different towns. Uh, maybe people will have a place to put uh, Monique up when she comes through town and, and her film crew. So um, it might right, save right. on the budget. So there's a lot of ways people can help that, that uh, we haven't thought of yet. Let me give you guys some uh, some websites you can go to. Monique's personal website is I Investigate, and that's I like I site. So it's E Y E I N V E S T I G A T E dot com. That's I Investigate dot com, or you can go to Investigatrix, and that's I N V E S T I G A T R I X X dot blogspot dot com. Oh, yes. And um, her personal email address is investigatrix, I-N-V-E-S-T-I-G-A-T-R-I-X, at gmail.com. So there's many ways that you can reach out to uh, Monique. And this is a, certainly a worthwhile project. And when I said this earlier, I really meant it. I mean, this is one of those things that all of a sudden this subject is really getting out there and it's something that... And listen, I I do. I try to keep my ear to the ground for for interesting subject matter and things that intrigue me because although many of these subjects seem depressing to people, these are the things that I'm interested in. And this is what, believe it or not, this is what I read when I'm just... When you're bored, when you're going to sleep. (laughs) That's right. And so um, this subject is something that is really getting out there in a very big way. So I would not be surprised if you do get your money. It's a worthy project. I hope that people will get behind this because I would love to see you be able to go out there, really investigate this subject and put this on on video so that people could see it. Right, exactly. And that's why people are visual. They might read, but they're more visual. They like to see what's going on. They need to see that place where that person was and now it's not and their clothes are missing or they're sitting there or what are some of these witnesses that we are going to be talking to what do they look like i mean we need to put some kind of a documentary film behind this so people can actually see really with their own eyes what's going on yes if they don't see it it's like out of sight out of mind right over the past year um these stories of guys like jimmy savile um these, this radio DJ in the BBC, and it, 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 the whole pedophile thing is finally being shown to the world in all its ugliness, and finally people are going to jail for it. And the only reason I bring that up is, as we were speaking earlier, there are times, it seems, when children are disappeared for these types of purposes, and I hope that's not what's going on here, but... 
everything's on the table. Um, well, and priests are finally losing their diplomatic immunity over prosecution God. and stuff. Yeah, it's about time. Damn right. But the church that ruled the world and ran the world run by men yes. is finally, uh, finally being held a little bit accountable. And we've known for generations that this has happened and politicians have, have done this with little boys in the, in oh, the yeah. Senate, Congress. So, so it, we need to take this momentum and, as a public, have a way to have a voice and get angry about this. It's, uh, it's, and of missing in clusters, that's something else, Monique. You know, they keep saying that people are missing in clusters. I'd like to understand that better. How do you go missing in clusters? Is this well, people the only thing I can say, people? honestly, Don, when people go, in, uh, they go missing in clusters, according to David Politis, basically it comes to my mind that some kind of a dimension or time warp has opened where all these people have gone in at the same time and some of them coming out. That's why they're all disorganized and they don't know where they are. They don't recognize their own backyard while they never really went anywhere. So that that's a surprise. And I'm not taking it from that perspective. I'm well, check, ta- check this out. Maybe I misunderstood. When, when, when I was reading the cluster thing, I, I guess what I thought that they meant was that there were certain areas that there were higher percentages of these disappearances than other areas. And one of the things that I found very strange when looking at his map was that throughout the Midwest, there were no clusters. There was a swath throughout the mid part of uh, the continental United States in which there were no clusters at all. And if you take a look at the the primary map that he's got on his website, that the, there are none. So I mean, it, it's like it's all happening on the east and west coast. So I, I don't know what to make of it. Well, uh, that's another that's another edge that we have to look at. Basically, are there a lot of sightings of uh, UFOs there? And are there, I don't know, um, are we talking about, uh, a, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm into conspiracy theories, but I'm a, oh, I investigate these things, such as yes. like the Dulce base in New, yes. New Mexico, for example. There are these places inside, on the ground, in mountains, and uh, aliens are conducting experiments with humans. That's so horrible. If that's when true. you're I mean, telling listen, me I've, that there are some I, I, places, oh no, it's definitely true. The Ulster base actually exists and they have done investigation in those places where they have found out that that's definitely, you know, out there. I mean, that's fact. But what I'm wondering, if those places that people don't go missing in clusters, what else is going on around there? That's another investigation that we need to do. So... Are there bases like Area 51 over there, or are there sightings of UFOs there? I don't know. Monique, when you said that's a fact, you mean that the fact is that Dulce Base exists, it does go underground, it is an amount of it's a top secret place. The question is, what is going on inside it? Exactly. We don't know. We just know that Phil Schneider, uh, he came out and talked about it. He he was shot in his arms, and then he got killed. Yeah. I wasn't there. All I'm, I'm just uh, stating the, the facts of what I saw and heard. Right. I, no, I, 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 I'm with you. I mean, listen, I, I'm to the point where, uh, for example, and I don't want to sound jaded, but, you know, a week or two ago when the beheading video uh, of Foley was started showing, it's like I wouldn't even watch it because my initial feeling just on an emotional level is like, you know what, that's probably fake. And that gentleman, unfortunately, is probably deceased. However, at this point, I have seen so much skullduggery and so much darkness and so much craven activity that I, I'm, it, it's, it's very hard for me to believe anything these days. And when I say that, I, I, I mean that I am skeptical of everything, especially things that are created and, and I'm not really attacking Dolce. I guess what I'm trying to say is like th- these days, nothing would surprise me. And um, I hate to sound that in a way it's kind of liberating because I, I, I just, I can't I don't, I don't mean to interrupt here, but you know, I, I know there's, there's so many questions about, you know, that, that journalist that was executed. Yes. And yes. I, I feel personally, the guy who ever was executed, that dude's definitely dead. 
but <clears throat> they're saying that. Are we still on, you guys? I'm here, Joel. I think we might. Yeah, have hello. Been. Are you still there? Oh yeah. Okay, now here. now you're back. Right here. That's strange. Um, the the uh, th- with our government's technology, they said they've successfully identified who the the gentleman who was. Uh, I don't know, the gentleman, the guy who did the beheading, the gentleman who carried out the act. They said they've successfully identified him uh, with facial recognition uh, engineering software. software, which was very strange because, you know, he, he was just, he, just his eyes were exposed. He was yeah. uh, he was well hidden besides that. But they said, no worry about that. That wasn't an obstacle at all, which yeah. I find really amazing. But they but they lack in in so many other key aspects. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't mean to derail our thread. My, I'm my sorry point, to interrupt. No, no, no. It's okay. I, listen, believe me, I got a lot of questions about that thing. My point is, you raised with, an actually interesting thread there. I'd like to comment on a moment. Go, go for it. Oh well, we've had facial recognition software since the, they actually had it in the '70s, but uh, and and this has developed. You know, facial recognition, voice recognition, they can look, have a camera if the camera's got the acuity to look at your iris from a great distance. When I was a kid, they used to tell us the Golden Gate Bridge, they had the cameras up there, and this was in the 70s, that they could actually focus the camera down on your eyeball and tell what color your, your eye was and read your, they, I couldn't read your iris at that point. But now we, the government's finally letting it out. They're letting us know, which is interesting. It's an interesting tell. They're saying that from a video shot in the desert through somebody else's camera, that there's enough acuity and enough information on that film that they can tell who this guy is just from his eyes. They, and they're yet they're very people, confident about it. Right. Strong so confident, with, without doubt. Either they're, uh, they're v- that confident or they're going to pin it on someone with, with, no matter what anyone says. Well, what you what you got to realize is there's public cameras all over the place, including uh, important nodes like all the airports. So as you through all the airports, you're being filmed, and your eyes are being checked. Um, if you carry money in your bag, there's chips and there's strips in the money that they can read how much money you have on your person right. if they have the, the sensor there. So we're a society of sensors. The interesting thing is we're talking about people missing the national parks, people missing other places, and yet there's no help. There's no use of these resources in anywhere else. Only when it becomes national issue um, of somebody killed just one person by... Supposed they they bring it out. So I, why is I agree? Serious. Yeah. And 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 I'm and I'm highly skeptical because how are we going to contest that? Okay, you're telling me you positively identified this man. Well, guess what? I'm 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 Joe Blow sitting here watching my television. I'm pretty much going to have to take you at your word because I cannot really contest that. And all I'm saying is this technology that they supposedly have and they can't find the Malaysian Airlines and. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. These, these types of things confound me because on one level, I'm sure that we have these types of technologies. And then on the other hand, they're not being used. If, in fact, these people are disappearing in these numbers from these national parks, you would think that we would not be sitting here having this conversation now to the level that we are having if we had these types of technologies which supposedly exist. Something's wrong because on these CSI shows, they show the live satellite feeds, right? Right. Right. <laughs> Actually, they've had those for quite some time, at least 20 to 30 years. And Well, actually, I personally know that they had the ability to have live satellite feeds in the, back in the 70s and 60s, but it wasn't as good as it is now. So here's the other question. You have oil tankers in the Gulf right? with 7, 8, 20 people on them. And those slow-moving large vessels can get hijacked and disappear. How does that happen? Right. You know, how do these people come in a little boat, hijack this thing, and take it off to a port? Those things don't have GPSs on them when your car does. So there, there's there's a lot of things amiss in our world where the technologies don't connect and the information doesn't connect. Why wouldn't the government be involved in trying to find out about how many kids, Monique? 180,000 kids going missing. Right. And in fact, uh, just recently, uh, a lot of children are coming from overseas into the United States. Who are these children? How are they getting here? Why are they here? Are we uh, adopting them? Are we making them into 
to slaves. I mean, nobody's asking the question here. And well, that's now, the whole we have thing. a lot of Mexican immigrants as well coming in in a, in a great deal, which we haven't what? heard much of lately, but I, I'm sure it's probably uh, twofold the amount crossing lately. Right. And, and now, interestingly enough, these are children that yeah. are from orphanages supposedly coming into the United States. Where are they going to go? Who's taking them? I have to tell you, when I was talking to Ted Gunderson, he was talking about the Bohemian Grove yeah. uh, subject, which is, as you know, down the street from us, <laughs> right here yeah. in Northern California, where we actually, every August, we see helicopters dropping people down to Bohemian Grove, and they go up in helicopters and disappear. I read, and... Ted Gonderson had some people undercover working inside the Bohemian Grove where uh, these children, as young as uh, five years old, and by the way, I hate to say that, but my book is about this. I, that's why it's so hard for me to finish it because it's so hard to, <laughs> to talk about the subjects. But these kids, as young as five, 10, 15, come in to Bohemian Grove and there's all these politicians and this and that. Oh, that's all I'm going to say. Right. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe during uh, when we were having the Serbian War in the in the late '90s that there was some child trafficking or sexual trafficking that was happening, which eventually ended up getting linked back to um, U.S. based humane services. Do you guys right. remember that? Yes. Mm-hmm. And well, I mean. Uh, United States is a source country as well as the, the uh, destination see. country. Basically, what that means, there are countries that their, their destination is to receive these children. United States is one of them, Denmark, Germany, France, and then there are the source countries such as Moldova, Ukraine, uh, Serbia, yeah. um, of so. course, uh, Thailand and India. Yes. Poor, poor countries mostly. Basically, yeah, absolutely. Poor, poor, but then again, you would think that Turkey is a poor country. But definitely Turkey is one of the receiving countries. Yes. Well, they also countries where they can take children either into different forms of slavery or servitude without um, oversight, without the ability for review. But there's also the there's also the kidnapping for legal adoptions where uh, Europeans or Americans will pay quite a lot of money to do- adopt a child, and they're yes. thinking that legitimately adopting a child whose parents have been orphaned, but in fact, it may have been a child that was just taken out of a village, mm-hmm. and there's I, yes. resources. Yeah, the village in Africa, the village in India, they don't have any way in a shanty town to try to go after to the authorities and say, hey, my child's missing. They'll say, well, there's, there's uh, 100,000 kids in the street. You tell me where your kid is. We, they're not even going to look for them. So there's right. no, no um, impunity. These can do it with impunity. Then all they have to do is export the children. That's probably the hard part. Get them to another country through pipelines and then sell them as adopted. They're allowed. Well, Don, um, and I wanted to just let everyone know, basically those countries when they're – when people are making what a few hundred dollars a year, yes. they will sell their own child. That's exactly That's what the happens in Indian places like that. They sell their children, and they, they some of us might believe they're selling them to something not so uh, clandestine or negative. And others mm-hmm. may have drug problems. And will they, even Americans? Uh, there, there have been, um, you know, people in first world countries who have drug habits who have sold their children. Yes. Well, I just did a case, if I can uh, share that with you guys. Absolutely. Just recently, uh, five, six months ago, I was approached by this Brazilian aunt of this child, two-year-old boy, uh, Jao. His name is Jao. I, I forgot his last name. Anyways, right from his own backyard, front yard, backyard. Actually, the backyard was facing the river. So the front yard. The door was left open. The child, everybody was home. The child was just right outside in their yard, taken. During the investigation, in fact, I brought the the aunt and my other client to my show so we can start talking about this case. And as it turned out, the grandfather sold his own grandson to traffickers that are involved with adoptions 
in Israel. So it goes from Brazil to Venezuela. From Venezuela, it's the adoption company uh, has the parents that come from Israel check out the children. And this child, a beautiful, green eyes, kind of a dark skin, just a beautiful, beautiful child. That's what they like. They like that European look. And did, they take him back to Israel. Did, did you, were you able to retrieve the child? No. The child okay. was gone. The, the child was yeah. taken. The case is still open. Yeah. And interestingly enough, everybody was involved. The law enforcement was involved. The grandfather was involved. Uh, the adoption. In other words, when something like this goes on, there's no end to it. There's no way you can actually get the ch- child back because you are facing bureaucracy after bureaucracy of many countries. Well, I'd like to mention something too, Monique, that's come yeah. up and working with you. Um, one of the reasons that I volunteered to help Monique, I, I've had to deal with a issue. Well, anyway, uh, I, I've, I've volunteered for a lot of things all my life and I've watched Monique do this stuff at, on uh, what I would call a shoestring budget. Essentially, one of her specialties is recovering lost and stolen children. But when a family comes to you and says, hey, I lost my kid, can you find him for me? Well, Monique can't go reach into her pocket without you know, a case coming in, buy an airline ticket, buy, buy the hotel rooms, rent a car, hire other investigators that she has in her international network, or take a team of three or four with her um, to go recover a child without the budget to do that. Yes. And so this is the sad prospect is – Here's this family in Brazil. Now, some families in Brazil have a lot of money, and even in the middle class, the amount of money to recover a child would be very difficult. But this family had tried to hire investigators, and they had botched it up. They approached Monique, and she got involved and was willing to do the case. And um, they were the, the people when they come to Monique. I've seen they're they're already skeptical and reticent because they've been taken by attorneys, they've been taken by investigators who did either a shoddy job or really didn't uh, commit themselves. Mm-hmm. And so in, in this particular case, the grandfather went ahead and gave the money to another local investigator in, in Brazil, and uh, Monique was ready to, to get a flight and go down there. But uh, she ended up, the family contacted her again, and I watched Monique help this family because she knew a lot about the case as much as she could pro bono, but it meant she couldn't actually go down on location with a team. So the, the problem is trails go cold. Um, kids go missing and uh, you need to act quickly. And in some cases, like in Mexico, which uh, Mexico is experiencing a kind of pandemonium in their system that where gangs and drug cartels have taken over, that if you don't pay somebody off, you don't get that child back. Yeah. So the realism is you may be able to find and locate that child when you have the right grease to grease the palms. And then you have to go back and say, hey, we want that child back. And um, it, it's also a scary thing because it feeds the beast. Um, they have control. They have absolute yeah. control. And um, when you go into a small Mexican town um, that's controlled and run by gangs and you start knocking on doors and asking questions, do you think that gang doesn't know that you're in town and you're there? So you risk um, literally getting killed without even coming to the, the end story. So there, there are some fuzzy edges here that um, – we may never be able to recover certain children. Um, yeah. it, it's it's sad. It's it's yeah. hard. In to fact, uh, Don, I, I don't know if you know or not, but um, I just took the Mexico out of my website today. Just today, I took it out because of so many people. No one want to wants to work a Mexican case anymore for me or with well, me. Uh, and I, it, I and these are the Mexicans years. in Mexico. They don't want to work. It. Go ahead. I, I, somebody got cut off. You, I'm sorry. You've had a lot of cases want to come to you. And, and, uh, I, had five. Last I had five just last year. Uh, within three, four months, I was working five Mexican cases. Boy, children taken out of this woman's stomach. A twin children taken out of her stomach. Did, and did, so okay, did so did, did, did they... Did they did they kidnap the woman and then put her under yes, and cesarean yes, they, the children? Yes, yeah. they kidnapped her from the hospital and they took the children and they wanted to hire me and go. I mean, I'm talking about 
absolute horror yeah. when, when, when we're talking about children involved in trafficking and mafia in Mexico, in Colombia. So, it'll figure that out. I mean, you know, don't read Monique's book unless you got a good stomach, but, but read yeah, it. But, you know, <laughs> you know you people, need to, people need to be able to handle the fact that we're not just in this safe little country and don't get involved in the rest of the world. I need to understand the consequences and the risks out there and then teach their children. When you go out in college and you're going to parties and you say handed a drink, I mean, now that's common knowledge. It could have something in it. Be careful. You might end up, you know, uh, taken advantage of, raped, or that's just, okay, fine, by by a fraternity. But how about if you ended up on a boat to another country? You know, that's even scarier. And then when you're traveling, same thing. You can be a target. So there's possibilities out there that people are... Here. They learn what the signs are. They Don, learn how to pay attention and off. how to act um, by ex- exponents. The risks, I'm sorry, just saying that people, if they educate themselves as to what's out there and what yeah. to look for, you can actually reduce a lot of this. You can watch your own children. Um, I see people leaving their kids in situations where um, just today I was someplace and the lady put the child in a little pen in the front yard and then she goes in the house, she's getting stuff in the car and she's gone for 10 minutes at a time. And yeah, okay. So there's, there aren't that many people around. It's a little apartment kind of complex, but what's going to happen if somebody walk, walked up, grabbed that kid and took off in a van, somebody might be lucky enough to see the make and model of the van. They're not going to get the license plate, you know, right. kids right. gone. I, I have often when I'm running, I see little children running by themselves. I'm talking about seven, eight years old and I'm, and I'm asking, where are your parents? Oh, a parent, the parents are about a mile away talking to each other, just walking very comfortably. And these children are running in front and anyone could take them. But anyways, we are talking about the National Park <laughs> children. But, but this subject, okay, my book is called Children of uh, the Underworld. I'm Good almost day. finished with it. <laughs> I'm having a hard time. It's based on my true story of the case that I've started uh, as a parent of child abduction. It went trafficking in Malaysia. And I'm changing it around. I made it into more of a fiction instead of non-fiction. So, uh, 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 I have to run around collecting signatures. Let's also say you combine um, all kinds. Oh. It got to read it. It's, 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 excuse me? Who talked? I'm, I'm sorry. I was I was losing Monique's signal for a second. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Don, you were saying something. Well, Go ahead. Um, you were you were mentioning when you cut out that you had changed it from a novel of fact to make it fiction, but that the elements that you have in it are either from the core is this one case, and you've combined elements from other cases that you've done, yes. as well as cases that you buy the research or work with other investigators. So what it has is it's chock full of realism in a fictional story. And it's also yes. interwoven with very real, very visceral events to yes. give people a, a wake up call as to, you know, you're going to be on the, a little bit on the outside track with an investigator trying to find this stuff. And at moments yep. you're taken on the inside track to what's happening with this child while, while they're exactly. going other children. It's, it's mm-hmm. pretty visceral. And, you know, the other thing that I tell people is, you know, if you if you think this is bad, when they have taken a child into trafficking, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, or other uses, and that child becomes 20 to 25, they may be of no use. They may be drugged out or, or wrung out like an old sponge. And, and what they'll do then is they have to decide what to do with this person. And one of the ways that they can make a profit off these people is actually uh, take all their organs and sell their organs. So if you are an organ receiving eyeballs or a kidney um, and you're on the operating table, you don't know, you, there's no idea on that kidney. You don't know if that kidney came from someone who was put on methamphetamines and put through sex trafficking for five to 10 years before they uh, yeah. wore out and they were sick or dying and they, they grabbed them, yet it's a young enough organ to be taken. So um, yeah. it, it's, it gets to the point where people don't even want to listen. They'll turn off. It, 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 
we're coming back to the national parks, the idea is exactly. that we know all these sources. We know people go missing actual sources. And then the question is the numbers that go missing. And just in the national park was, was the foci because of this other gentleman brought the case to us. Then Monique thought, what a great place to start because we know there's numbers there. We know there's hidden information. And, uh, and, and I've actually have- done cases from children that have gone missing from national parks. It just never uh, dawned on me that they could be t- taken, you know, any, any other way except by people. Now, if it's paranormal, right. if it's UFOs, if it's government, if I come across that, then I want to report that. I want to report it all, except I want to make a documentary out of it. There you go. And, and try to discern if we can, if we can uh, which one of these are unexplainable, which one of these might be. Are there, is there any evidence that, uh, that this is going on the motorcycle gangs are still taking? Because this was a big thing. It was a big thing in the 80s. And they did quell some of it. There were points where some of the national parks would lose control for a while. If a whole bunch of the motorcycle gangs would come in and they couldn't get them out. Uh, um, yeah. Maybe that's I, 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 we keep losing. No, I, I where... Yes, Michael. Well, I, I certainly. Okay, so I certainly the motorcycle gang situation. I mean, listen, I I was I was in high school in, in the seventies and college in the eighties. I'm giving away my age, but I remember even in <laughs> in my backwoods areas of Texas uh, when the motorcycle gangs would come through, and we had some regional gangs. You know, everybody was really freaked out, and they would go to um, a couple of the lakes that were in our portion of the state. And they'd just show up in town, and they would be there for a weekend or a week or something, and everybody would leave them alone. And I'll be honest, I don't know if they were truly dangerous or if they were low-level gangs. All I know is they got everyone's attention, and we stayed very far away from them. So when I hear about uh, motorcycle gangs going to the national parks, it it makes sense to me. I mean, they've got to go somewhere. some people might yeah, ask, like well, they can't why, take over. how do we know these disappearances aren't occurring? Right. They, they have easy access where um, they, they, they could break and enter into someone else's property or a, a farm or ranch, but it's easier just to go into a place that um, already is wide open and, and has uh, camping facilities. Well, what yeah, I find well, what, interesting yeah, is yeah. that uh, in Politis, um approach is not just girls. Because when it comes right. to motorcycle gangs, they're usually either girls because they, they rape them, they take them, or younger right. children. But in his approach, is more people, men and yes. women, and it, I mean, all kind of adults. That's uh, right. I just need to see who are the witnesses he's interviewed. I need to um, re interview them and find out exactly where, in my own. Witnesses, you see what I mean. So it's it's kind of, of strange to me because these people are going missing, not just motorcycle gangs that could be at national parks taking the children or women. So what about the men? No, I, Why are they going missing? I agree with you, and I heard in a in a in an interview that he had where somebody was posing the uh, the question. Well, like, well, what about you know uh, illegal immigrants or or, or drug uh, cartels or whatever? And and based upon his. Uh, uh, experience and his evidence, he really did not think that either of those were culprits in these disappearances. Now, getting back to our earlier point, listen, I think there's probably several different things going on here, but just in his primary cases where he was talking about the truly mysterious ones, he definitely did not think that these were, uh, you know, illegal immigrants or, or drug cartels or anything of that nature. He thought it was something far stranger than that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know because, you know, unless you have seen UFOs, unless you have seen USOs, and right. nobody believes them. I mean, only about 40% of population or less believe UFOs actually exist. Well, I have to say I agree with you too because I haven't said it, and I'm very skept- I'm probably maybe even more skeptical than Monique. But uh, the fact the numbers and that leads me to wonder, and, and this other investigator saying that it looked like there's something paranormal or some other thing other than these known sources. It's that, that like I said, it doesn't account for the number. You can't have the, just those numbers. So I'm really curious as to what kind of event could be going on here. 
uh, for mass right. abductions. Right. Well, I hope that right. people contribute to, to, to your film because this is a worthy cause. It is a, a true mystery. Um, families are hurt hurting because of this and and the thing the the, the, the ultimate <sighs> irony is not the right word here but these people like i said in my little blurb these people went to these parks seeking solace uh wanting to take refuge in beautiful surroundings and and this is what happens and it's just a, it's a terrible situation and the fact that investigators are coming up against difficulty in getting the the facts and the documentation that they need under these circumstances, the whole thing just stinks. Right, right. Yeah, it does. I mean, um, and in, interestingly enough, nobody really talks about it. And who, nobody was talking about it before Politis. I have That's been right. asking these questions for years, except that I'm not talking about the national parks. I was talking about right. where are our children? And yes. in fact, where I talked to Forrest Gamble of Thrive Movement, and they were very interested in uh, backing me up in some other projects of the sex trafficking things. But uh, I'm wondering, <laughs> what is wrong with people? Why is everybody so quiet? Or are they hushed? I, I think that there's, I, I think that. <sighs> It's like what Don said earlier. I mean, and, and I take my hat off to you, Monique, because honestly, I don't know if I could do the work that you do. I'm certainly a good, I'm, I'm good at feeling out people's motivations and knowing when I'm around bad folks. But the part that I couldn't do is seeing the tragedies that you see um, with children. I, and I take my hat off to you for the work that you do, because I don't know that if I could take it. And I think that's a lot of reason that people don't want to talk about it because they don't no. to talk about it means you've got to think about it. And to think about it means you internalize it. And on right. some level you must feel it. And so it's better to just pretend that it does not exist, or you might be afraid that my gosh, if I start talking about it, then, then am I suddenly going to become part of that? It, it's, it's, it's right. just a horrible situation. Well, two things. First of all, personally, I have nothing to lose except my life, I guess. I, uh, that's a lot. I've, I know, but I have plenty of other ones coming up. <laughs> that's, that's true, too. Uh, my, when I was younger, uh, my friends used to say, my God, Monique, you have such a suicide mission. You have a suicide type of... Uh, personality. I mean, why are you going to Singapore, for God's sake, doing this and that? And I, I said, you know, what? I don't think about it. I just do the re next step coming up. That's it. I don't think about the danger of it. I just know what needs to be done. And second thing is, I admire that. Um, thank you. But I also think that people rather watch the television and watch their Kardashians and and pretend like nothing is really going on and just have a good dinner. That's why it's so hard for me to write the book because everybody who has read my book so far, they can't stomach it. Here's yes. the other thing is being from Iran, uh, I saw a movie called Stoning of Soraya M. Stoning of Soraya M. Okay. Unbelievable. It was in one of the villages. It was right after Khomeini's uh, and the father, the husband, and the children stoned this poor woman to death. And everybody in the village watched. And for no reason. They just said she looked at someone with the wrong eyes, you know, like uh, infidelity, which right. she didn't. And then for 20 minutes, this stoned her to death. And I cried. And I watched and I made myself watch it because I felt if I don't watch it, then who, 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 who will? Then her, her death Understood. is no, I mean, that's the least I can do is watch it and feel something and cry about it. And I brought my sister. I said, you have to watch it. And she was hiding under the pillow. I'm like, no, you have to watch it. You owe it to her and all the other women who go through this, that's the least we can do. I'm sorry. I'm no, I, 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 
can't talk about I, it. I appreciate your passion because somebody has to do these things. Somebody has to feel the call, and you were heeding that call. And like I say, I do, I, I admire that. Thank you. Thank you. So, let me ask you this. On, yes. Let me ask you this. If, if, if you can get the, the documentary funded, um, where would you like to start? Where, where would you want to go first? Well, I guess uh, the documentary, first of all, I have to put it back to all the backers who backed it up and they want to see it. They want to see the video. I'd like to do talk shows. Uh, I like to get it on in front of people, show it at conferences, show it mm -hmm. to people. I mean, media yeah. is the, the strongest tool we have. Absolutely. Television is the strongest tool, but radio is the next. I, I've spoken in conferences about human trafficking, uh, and uh, it's very successful. And I can't tell you how many times little children, and I've spoken in a lot of high schools, and middle schools, believe it or not. And I can't tell you how many children, after the, my, my talk, they come up to me and they said, they were raped, or they were sold, or they were this and that. And I look at them, and they tell me that, thank you, thank you, because they, don't, they, they didn't know anybody else would do it. You know that my kidnapping, I never talked about it until 2010. Until I actually stood in front of 25 high school kids, strangers, told them about my story so they can take on the task of doing the film. Monique, I have not asked you about that. Is that something we can talk about or is it not something we should talk about? Um, no. It's up to I, you. Yeah. I don't know. What do you want to ask? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. You you said I bel unless I missed something. You said this happened, um, I guess, in in Beverly Hills, and I right. believe you were nineteen, correct? Right. Were you kidnapped by someone you knew, or was it a complete stranger? Complete stranger. I, but I was naive about it. I was naive about it because, interestingly enough, he was a multi-millionaire artist in Beverly Hills. He had a studio he, he had a painting studio and he was very very well known and guess what he was Iranian so when he was in his Rolls Royce and I was 19 and he told me that I looked like uh, Gina Luli Brigida <laughs> I don't know right, who, sure. anybody knows who she is and at the time and uh, he says he wants to paint me mm -hmm. and at the time I was really broke and I said oh uh, he says he'll pay me to paint me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm thinking about my rent. I'm like, sure. wait. And plus, I'm a painter myself. And he said that he can actually put my paintings in his studio and sell them. And then he offered me a job to become his assistant. And you can just take it from there. You can imagine sure. that I was like, oh, my God, I went from nothing to now meeting this multimillionaire painter. And I love painting. And wow, my world is going to change. And he imprisoned sure, you? Yeah, he imprisoned me for many days. I'm sorry about and, that. And that's part, the book that I'm writing, one of the chapters, when I'm reminiscing back in time, I'm thinking about it. And you escaped as well. That's the other yeah, part. Yeah, I escaped. I escaped. There's no way to get away. Yeah, but I escaped. People, people use lots of different ways to control someone in these situations. Everyone thinks, well, I just don't get away, or how can they do this? And this is right in his apartment in L.A., right? So it's fine. no in his uh, art studio. Art studio. Mm -hmm. oh, but where did where did he keep? He kept you out of the public stream in a, for a while. in a hotel. Did he? Did he? Was any justice ever served over this? Well, um, no, because at the time, you know, I was new. I I I'm, I wasn't from this country. I was so new, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't even know who or what Understood. and I, my accent <laughs> was even right. heavier than it is now and right. I didn't even know anyone and I don't have parents I lost my parents many many years ago when I was 16 so and so I was alone I didn't know where to go and what to do so I didn't report them but now I do and what I told these kids at the Hillsburg High School here I told them I said you know what I'm not a victim and neither anyone else 
I am a survivor and I've gone on to get my degrees and get my masters and and now I'm doing this. So I'm telling you this because all you can do is like me is pass it forward to somebody else the knowledge that I've gained. So we're all success stories. I like that a lot. Uh, Monique, you are indeed a survivor. Um, what is next in this process? We're going to try to raise the money for the uh, the documentary. How else can we get the word out about this to help you out? Well, I, I really like to talk to the mayor of, uh, I don't know, Perilumas, Hillsburg, San Diego. Uh, a lot of actors are involved with missing children projects like Demi Moore and you know a lot of people are they care about this subject yes uh, so I like to get in front of people and tell them support it well, I, 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 hope need, that I need it I need $25,000 and uh, $1 or $1,000 it doesn't matter we just need to get it I hope that you get it let me ask you this um, the documentary are you are you looking at like a 30 minute? Are you looking at an hour? What What is your kind of idea of, of, of the length or, or is that even in the picture at this point? You just want it's to not make in it. The, yeah, I just want to make it. To be honest with you, I want to go to every major national parks. Yeah. And I don't want to just stop at national parks. It might be some other parks or wherever I feel intuitively that I need to go because I am very intuitive. And if I can't do that, then this documentary might turn out to be an hour mm -hmm. uh, it might turn well, into a film documentary there's quite a few national parks and one of the things to, uh, Monique I don't know if you realize how many there's national state parks and national monuments and they're amazing but there are probably are some where there's, there's a lot more activity than others so that right. might be the idea of exactly. where, where do we need to go first and it also depends on how thick we get in it how much information we get if, if we get a lot of information we're only going to, able to go to four or five parks and that takes up the entire documentary, then there will have to be a chapter two, but it it might be that as we uncover this information, we need to grind down in one particular area or spend a lot of the time and focus and money on, on whatever and, we find. Right? right, and the other thing that I do want to investigate is what else is going on around the national parks? Like, what is going on in that town, in that county? Yeah that stands out from other counties where there are more activity in there. What else is going on? Is there some kind of, uh, we need to investigate. We need to find out if there's something like a Area 51 there. Is there like gangs there? Are there Local government there? corruption. Local government, whatever it is, we need to yes. find out what is outside of these national parks that make this particular one high activity. So, I agree. So the investigation is going to be pretty big, and, and I'm, I'm good at it. So, And I need people like Don and my other, you know, the filmmakers that are coming with us to do it. And, and nobody's getting paid. We're all just paying. The money goes toward expenses. That's all it is. I understand. Yeah. Um, well, I, I want this to happen. I want the word to get out. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Monique Lasson. And uh, she is wanting to make a documentary about these disappearances through these national parks. I hope that you will go to her site, iinvestigate.com. That's E-Y-E, investigate.com, that iinvestigate.com, and investigatrix, I-N-V-E-S-T-I-G-A-T-R-I-X-X, dot blogspot.com. Or just look up her name, um, Google it, Monique Lasson, M-O-N-I-Q-U-E. Lesson, L E S S A N, and uh, help this wonderful lady out. This is a this is a good cause, and it is something that needs light shined upon it immediately. And Michael, I just wanted to let you know that I have asked Dan Willis, who is my uh, the person who was on my show actually just a couple of weeks ago on another subject of UFOs, but also mm -hmm. he does my website for me uh, because I'm we're doing some kind of a buttering. Anyways, uh, he has put the link to this project on my homepage website. And my website also is now linked to child uh, recovery detectives.com. So the first homepage, when you go to my website, this link, you can go to the link for 
the Kickstarter is right there. It's going to be on my homepage for the next 42 days. So people, all they have to do is just click on it. It takes it there and they can pledge whatever they want. And by the way, one more thing. I will have rewards for people who invest a little bit more money. And I'm going to get T-shirts out with the logo of the Vanished and the picture. So. Well, these, I... people can go directly to um, Kickstarter. And if they type in, the problem is there are different uh, different projects with the term Vanished in them. Okay. Uh, some more kind of horror movies. So if you type in Monique Lassan or L-E-S-S-A-N and uh, Vanish, then uh, you should find it. But Monique, on your website, I didn't see the link. And then uh, you mentioned he mentioned your blog. I, Is that yeah. Investigate Tricks with two X's? Yes. I find yes. That. Yeah, uh, I have the blog. Uh, Dan is actually putting the link in there today. So it might not be live yet, but we're working on that. Excellent. Okay. Well, you guys, this has been a, a really great in interview. And I appreciate both of you coming on. Don, Monique, this, is, this has been wonderful. This is a, a subject that I really didn't know a lot about until <laughs> literally this <laughs> week. And the, and the more I find out about it, the stranger it becomes. So I really hope that your documentary and your investigations are, are successful and that they happen. And I've really enjoyed our conversation tonight. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I would love to